Chai is the word for tea in Kiswahili. And Chai surrounds us as far as the eye can see, here in the beautiful highlands above Lake Victoria, amidst the vast tea estates of West Kenya. In our quest for tea, we have traveled halfway round the world, from Europe to Africa to Asia. In Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka, we watched 72-year-old Kutan serving tea with a grandeur and dignity reminiscent of colonial times. In surroundings worthy of a film backdrop, as old as the oldest tea plantations of Sri Lanka, formerly called Ceylon. The noble Gaul Face Hotel was built in 1864 and has remained virtually unchanged to this day. With its beautiful interior patios full of birdsong, its shady terraces, and of course its regal guest rooms, which have harbored the wealthy and famous, were the leading politicians or stars of the silver screen. Two generations of hotel guests have taken tea from Kutan, the Grand Seigneur with the tea tray. There are few places on earth where one can enjoy an authentic ambience of an era long past. Leaving Sri Lanka's beaches and the beautiful Indian Ocean far behind us, we drive up into the bizarre, craggy Himalayas. Toy Train is the pet name the local people have given the delightful miniature steam-powered train, which takes us on the eight-hour journey from Siliguri to Darjeeling. The little engine takes hundreds of narrow bends and crosses 300 bridges on its way up. Hissing and puffing, it climbs a spectacular 2,000 meters to its destination. The construction of this unique railway was indeed a pioneer's task when it was built 100 years ago. Last stop, Darjeeling. The center of the world's most exclusive tea growing district is perched on a lofty plateau. The first people to come here were missionaries. Then the British discovered the pleasures of the temperate climate and the pure, sweet mountain air. And before very long, modern times took over. The town owes its existence to tea, jutting up sharply out of the Bengal plains and enclosed by the sacred and mysterious states of Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan. The province of Darjeeling was, in former times, an almost inaccessible, barely inhabited and barren district on the northern borders of India. Diesel fumes and the hooting of horns characterize Darjeeling today. A lively provincial town, bursting at the seams with over 50,000 inhabitants. Darjeeling has retained a sense of nostalgia, of faded glory, of time brought to a standstill. And somehow we feel to be on top of the world. The majority of the population are Nepalese. Then there are Lepcha from the mountains, settlers from India and refugees from Tibet. Villagers from the surrounding tea gardens find all they need here. From a barber shop to beetle nuts, from straw hats to bright fabrics for a new shawl. Oh, 
Immediately next door to this neighborhood, we find the witnesses of a stately era now long past. And tea, of course, wherever you happen to be. This modest roadside ceremony with a tin teapot may not appear to do justice to the sophisticated ritual of making tea European style. Nevertheless, for connoisseurs of good tea, Darjeeling tea is a delicacy and a rare delight. Foop Searing is the name of this tea garden, situated close to the borders of Sikkim, a fairy tale state which was long segregated from the rest of India. It is in Indian hands now, like all the tea gardens, since 1947, the year of India's independence. These two gentlemen have invited us to look into the world of Darjeeling tea. Mr. Sharma and Mr. Prakash, occupation tea garden managers, masters over 900 hectares of tea plantation and responsible for 2,400 plantation workers. Transportation used to be a problem until the arrival of jeeps, which are indispensable today. What is it, we asked Mr. Prakash, that makes Darjeeling tea so special that it has been named the champagne of teas? The altitude, explains our host, and the unique climate. The monsoon winds blow the clouds up here. We get a lot of rain. The tea gardens are frequently swathed in mist, with clear blue skies and a view of the mountain peaks only in the autumn, after the rains. But this climate certainly suits the tea. Just how many tea gardens are there in Darjeeling? All in all, says Mr. Prakash, there are 72. And the total production? About 12 million kilograms per year, he tells us. A musical performance is to take place, and we have been invited as guests of honor. the dancers expressing with this performance? Well, like other dances all over the world, it concerns romance. Oh, I have not been to Europe for a long time, sighs the manager, Mr. Sharma. And then he shows us some very special tea bushes. These bushes yield superb quality tea, he says, as if he were speaking of vintage wine. He breaks off a shoot with two leaves and a bud to demonstrate how tea is plucked and proclaims, that's quality, excellent flavor, very popular with the Germans. Very much. Then he shows us a tea bush more than a hundred years old. The tea bushes are regularly pruned to keep them about one meter in height. Frequent plucking prevents them from flowering and keeps the surface plateau sheared. The young green shoots are what count for making tea. 
Seven days is all they need to grow again after plucking. It is not surprising, looking at this landscape, that all attempts to harvest tea using machines have failed. But that is just as well for the people who earn their living here. There is plenty of work for them, as plucking goes on nine months a year. The most sought after teas are the so-called first flush, to be harvested after the monsoon rains, followed by second flush. It is important that tea is produced without delay, whilst fresh, which is why the tea factories are situated in the heart of the gardens. <laughs> Each plucker's booty is weighed on these simple scales. The pluckers are paid according to the amount of tea in their basket. The tea that grows in Darjeeling is fairly small leafed. 6,000 shoots is approximately what a plucker can harvest in one day. And this amounts to just one kilogram of made tea. No wonder it is so costly. The plucking round is over and time for us to take a look at the little village, Rungli Rungliot. This is the school. Lessons are nearly over. Children's voices repeat what they have learned. Amongst the younger children, at least, so we are told later by the teacher, there is far less illiteracy than the big cities. In fact, they are better off here. The people live in wooden houses, some of them colourfully decorated. Everyday life is not exactly turbulent, unless there is a festivity of some kind taking place somewhere. A dog that can beg is a village attraction here. And strangers from overseas, armed with a film camera, are quite a sensation. The plantation villages are not older than two generations, and they are modern, equipped with electricity and running water, with schools, shops, and medical centre generally provided for the pluckers by the plantation. In the tea factory, work continues, and tea making is strictly men's work, apart from the plucking. Darjeeling tea is produced exclusively by the traditional orthodox method, which involves five separate processes, withering, rolling, fermenting, drying and grading. During the withering process, with the aid of air blown in by a fan, the green leaf loses 30% of its moisture content. The withered green leaf is taken to the rolling machine where it is rolled on rotating copper plates, which break open the leaf cells, bringing the juices into contact with oxygen. This starts the fermentation process. The leaf gradually changes its color. The rolling machine is emptied. The tea is inspected over and over again. A delicious, tangy smell. The tea is spread out evenly on these long tables so that it can continue to ferment. Fermenting takes two to three hours, depending on leaf size and the climatic conditions. All the excellence of the tea is activated. 
the tea is developing its characteristic flavor and color. After which, it is ready for drying. The tea is transported through the dryer on conveyor belts. Hot air caramelizes the juices and extracts most of the moisture. The tea is made. No, wait. First, it must be sorted into different leaf sizes. Experts call this process grading. These vibrating sieves with different size meshes separate the tea into various leaf sizes. Basically, we obtain whole leaf tea, broken tea, fannings, and dust. The tea specialists have yet finer distinctions. The terminology includes mysterious sounding formulas as GFBOP1 or SFTGFOP1. That stands for Special Fine Tippy Golden Flowery Orange Pico 1. At last, the finished product, ready for its long journey to the consumer. But it still has a long way to go before we can enjoy it. This is just the first lap of the long journey Darjeeling tea must make before it reaches its destination in the importing countries. Calcutta is the real starting point of the journey. Here we are in the heart of the city, which can be described as the world capital of tea. In chests and sacks, the tea is arriving here, mainly from Assam, Darjeeling and Duars in northern India, and is shipped to its destination via the port at the heart of Calcutta's business centre. Though some of it is drunk right here, at Haraz Stall, for instance, where we watch an impressive performance of cooling tea. It is then sold to thirsty customers for half a rupee in handmade, disposable earthenware bowls. Tea is drunk here with plenty of milk and sugar, very refreshing in temperatures of 35 degrees in the shade. particularly for hard-working people like so many in these streets. Here, where burdens are borne on heads and rickshaws are man-powered, tea is indeed a welcome refreshment. Tea shacks, tea counters of all shapes and sizes are to be found here by the thousand. And high above the milling crowds, the Tea Board of India, a state-controlled organization, India's top tea authority. At the tea board's office, we meet Mr. Mickey Chinoy, director of a leading tea trading company. Mr. Chinoy shows us a glimpse of the city, which has a population of 12 million and is a formidable challenge to any stranger here for the first time. A vast sea of bobbing heads an endless stream of humanity in constant motion. Not far from the bustle of the city, there are numerous oases of peace and quiet, such as the Jain Temple, where we are now. Or here, by Calcutta's famous landmark, the Victoria Memorial, an impressive sugary confectioner's masterpiece, erected back in 1921, in colonial times, to the memory of Queen Victoria, and constructed entirely from white marble. The dense traffic can only crawl alongside the bustle and hubbub of the street market. We are overwhelmed by the multitudes of sights and sounds, the urgent voices, the brilliant colors, and the exotic smells. And yet, despite the apparent confusion, every individual seems to have a definite purpose. After all the noise, 
It is a relief to relax on Mr. Chinoy's patio. Mr. Chinoy, what started you off in the tea business? Even as a child, tea held a deep fascination for me, he reminisces. And ever since then, my whole life has been involved with tea. After graduation, I joined a tea company. What is the meaning of Rungli Rungliot, we ask him. Rungli Rungliot is one of our tea gardens in Darjeeling. A legend has it that a monk was in search of the best tea of all. Having finally discovered it, he exclaimed, Rungli Rungliot, which means, this far and no further. He had come to the end of his quest. But we are only halfway through ours. At a golf tournament, Mr. Chinoy particularly wanted us to watch. The beautiful golf course is owned by the Royal Calcutta Golf Club, which has British tradition, as the name implies. The two golf courses that British colonial officers left behind them on their departure from Calcutta have been divided simply and fairly, with equality for the sexes. This one is for the men, the other one is reserved for the women players. Mr. Chinoy had a special reason for taking us here. This golf tournament is where Calcutta's high society from the world of tea enjoys its Sunday morning treat. A meeting place for the VIPs of the tea business, dynamic businessmen and their beautiful daughters. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, man. Here, by the languid green golf course, we are reminded of a Chinese proverb which says, a cup of tea disperses all worldly troubles. I hope the tea is fine. No doubt about it. The tea served here is indeed first rate. Meanwhile, Mr. Chinoy has won the golf tournament, as we had betted he would. The others seem to have returned to business matters. And how is the tea business prospering? We are interested to know. And who better equipped to answer our question than Mr. Johor, who runs the world's biggest tea booking house? Personally, I believe the coming years will prove positive for tea, he proclaims, because I don't see how world production can be stepped up any further. World demand, however, is increasing at an annual rate of 40 million kilograms, and I cannot see how that demand will be met in the future. This is from 1873. This book dates back to 1873, says Mr. Johor. At that time, tea from Darjeeling and Assam fetched half a rupee to one rupee per pound. Nowadays, Darjeeling tea is sold for up to 5,000 rupees per kilogram. Just look at this beautiful catalogue, the work of an artist. Compared with our modern computer-printed catalogue here, I think even the auctioneers have difficulty in deciphering it. 49 rupees not too much. 49. 49 to not too much. 40. Saha. 49 Saha. 49. 49 Saha. 49. There's quite a racket in here. This is where the tea is weighed up in terms of money. The busy tea auction, heart of international tea business, takes place once a week. 40, 50 CK. Only 10,000 kilograms were sold at the first auction in 1861. Today we sell 10 million kilograms each week, explains Mr. Johor. That's 500 million kilograms a year. 45 lotus, lotus, 45 lotus, lotus, lotus. And now we understand why tea is called green gold. And the auctioneer's hammer sounds not only in Calcutta, Colombo, Mombasa and London, but also Cochin for Nilgiri tea from South India. And how is the price determined? What counts basically is fine flavour. Is everything ready for the tea tasting session? In a minute, Mr. San, the director, will be here. Now we'll be uh, tasting teas for auctions. <coughs> nice. 
Leaf size, structure and colour are examined. Flavour is most important, of course. And spitting is permitted here as part of the job. Good nose. Other characteristics can be judged by sense of smell. Good fire. I think this is better, eh? Mm. I like that. 179. Mr. Sen's findings are taken down minutely and sent together with samples to potential buyers. This is for Nar Habi. He rejects that particular tea. It will not fetch a good price. This is a lovely looking tea. But this one obviously is a winner. It sold at over 300 rupees. That's a fantastic price. The price range is uh, very wide. As we would say in the trade, the concertina is now wide open. 39 to 49. And then? There are about 160 buyers who operate in the CTC auctions, but this morning you saw about 100 of them operating actively in the sale. From India, the classic tea producing country, our journey takes us on to Kenya. Our first stop is the government run Tea Research Foundation in Kericho. One of the scientists shows us what a tea bush would look like if not kept waist high by plucking and pruning. A fully grown tea tree, easily 15 meters high. Now these are the tea seeds. When the seeds are ready, the fruit open and the seed drop on the ground and we collect the seed from the ground. But only for cultivation purposes. The most common method of propagation used today is by taking cuttings. Like here, we would go for the big plants like this one, like this one. For example, we would go for a shoot like this one and then make cuttings uh, from this shoot. And what we usually do, we would remove the very soft parts, like that one, and then make individual cuttings like this. The young cuttings are planted out in the nursery in pots and kept well watered. After planting the cuttings, they are watered thoroughly. And then they are pampered in warm, damp beds and gradually grow into young plants, exact copies of the mother plants, clonal tea, as we say. Once the young plants have grown to a fair size, they are transplanted and kept under observation. Only the sturdiest are selected for the tea plantation. Tea needs time. It takes three to four years before the young tea shrubs can be plucked for the first time. Clonal tea is easily recognizable. Because the plants are genetically identical, their growth is perfectly uniform. The baskets fill up quickly here, not only thanks to the young men's dexterity. The tea that grows in Kenya has large leaves which make it very bulky. It rains here at least once a day, but the blue and yellow clad pluckers in their waterproof hats always have a song on their lips. A different kind of music can be heard coming from the church on Sunday in the tiny village of Karatina. The congregation gathered here makes its living from tea. 60% of Kenya's tea is produced by family enterprises, smallholders, such as these in Karatina. They are home workers, so to speak. The Mwai family is a typical example. 
Their tea plantation reaches right up to the back of their garden. Jack is playing as usual. Teresa, proud mother of six, has fetched the cow for milking. Purity and Elizabeth, the two eldest, are on their way home from school. The Muais produce their own meat, their own milk, and their own vegetables. They built this house five years ago. It's very modern, so they tell us proudly. In fact, the Moais are very much in favor of modern progress in general. The Moais set store by cleanliness. And grace is said as a matter of course. The Muais invite us to accompany them to a church service. The singer's harmony and fervor must be the envy of any European parish priest. Back to the field, the tea must be harvested. Little Lucy, Teresa's youngest, is trying her hand at plucking. It is common for the whole family to help. The freshly plucked tea is then taken to a central collection point. This also provides an opportunity for an exchange of local gossip. These communal collection points are located at numerous places throughout the tea districts, set up with the aid of the Kenya Tea Development Authority, which takes over the green leaf, organizes its transportation to the tea factory, and markets the tea on behalf of the smallholders. They know that tea needs careful treatment. The green leaf must not be crushed, otherwise it will begin to ferment through lack of air before it arrives at the factory. We also run an advisory service, Dr. Awar, a biochemist, tells us, to instruct the growers about the best methods of cultivating tea. We help them create the right ecological and agricultural conditions to produce good quality tea. Meanwhile, the green leaf is on its way to the tea factory and is kept nicely ventilated thanks to the truck's airy construction. This thoroughly modern big tea factory is typical of Kenya's dynamic tea industry. It is equipped with modern machinery and the latest technology. Designed for the production of large quantities of tea. The common method of production in Kenya is called CDC. This stands for cutting, tearing, curling. As if propelled by an invisible hand, the sacks of tea are hauled up. This is where the green leaf is spread out flat on huge withering racks, which fill an entire hall. After withering, the green leaf is minced in preparation for the next step in the CTC machine, where it is ground to a pulp between rollers moving in opposite directions. This process takes 80 to 120 minutes, including fermentation. The result is an homogenous small leaf tea 
that ferments quickly because of its large surface area and is very economical. CTC tea is then fermented in the same way as tea produced by the orthodox method. It gradually takes on a reddish hue. Firing is the next process, which involves drying the moist leaf to turn it into the black tea we all recognize. By the way, CTC production limits the number of grades that can be obtained, yielding mainly fannings and 20% dust grades, but no leaf grades. Fannings are ideal for a quick, strong brew, which is why they usually go into tea bags. Up to the tea chests, and we're off. Jack Mutambo's rhinoceros truck has a thousand kilometers to go before reaching the port of Mombasa. We shall accompany him as far as Nairobi, and we have been looking forward to this trip for a long time. winds on like an endless ribbon. No zebra crossing to hold us up on our way to Nairobi. The nocturnal skyline of East Africa's biggest metropolis is our last impression of Kenya. Jack will spend the night here before making the final leg of his trip another 600 kilometers down to Mombasa. We move on to our next destination in our quest for tea. Sri Lanka. The little train has brought us up into the highlands of Ceylon. When talking of tea, Sri Lanka is still known as Ceylon. It's a question of tradition. Tea was first grown here in 1867, after the coffee plantations had been completely destroyed by blight, something which will not happen to tea. And here are Dr. Vitane and Dr. Herat on their way to work. Their job is to protect the Holy Grail. In other words, to ensure that the tea flourishes. 
using modern scientific methods to maintain and improve the tea plants. Our companions will be at work shortly at the Tea Research Institute at Talawakeli. The impressively stocked library gives us some idea of the vast amounts of knowledge this research work involves. Because tea is a product, a commodity produced for human consumption, we tend to minimize on the usage of... Tea is a very important commodity to us, or any Dr. Vitani tells us. That could be Therefore, our job here is to develop natural and healthy and methods for cultivating tea. If we can give up chemicals totally, that's the best situation we should aim at. I suppose we want to keep our tea free of any harmful substances. There are numerous departments here that deal with various aspects, involving the soil, the tea plant itself, cultivation, biochemistry, product processing, and pest control using new biological methods. Our aim is to eliminate the use of chemicals entirely and to establish a sound ecological balance between tea and the environment. Very useful integrated pest management system for tea without having to depend on any kind of these harmful chemicals as far as human beings are concerned. In about another 10 minutes time we can take it out. So we usually keep it for... We find Dr. Herat amongst laboratory paraphernalia. How would he describe his task? Well, here at the Tea Research Institute, I function as the biochemist, and uh, I am in charge of the biochemistry division. And in this division, our research is uh, divided into three important areas. Uh, number one is product improvement. The second area is product development. And the third area is product diversification. Dr. Herat's assistants celebrate a rather different tea ceremony to the one we are accustomed to, using most unusual pots. Here, tea is distilled, extracted, experimented with, and analyzed. Tea, we discover, contains 1.5 to 4% caffeine, 8 to 20% catechine, and volatile oils. Together with traces of vitamins and minerals, we get a beverage which is both stimulating and beneficial. A surprisingly large number of scientists at the Tea Research Institute are women. The lady in the flowing blue sari is Dr. Nalini Ganana Prakasam. She is going to show us the experimental garden. These young plants are guinea pigs, so to speak. The objective is to produce tea plants which are resistant to pests, the enemies of tea. Which methods are you working on? I'm working with plant paraffin. I'm a biological scientist, she tells us. Our task is to evolve natural methods to control pests that attack tea plantations. And how is that done? Nematodes. We use microorganisms which have the ability to destroy these enemies of the tea bush without disturbing the delicate ecological balance of tea gardens. Roots of the tea plant causing economic damage. Tea is a completely natural product, and its environment here in Sri Lanka is unspoiled. The scientists at the tea research, who have studied in Europe and America and seen a different picture in some places there, are naturally eager to preserve this healthy ecological balance. And tourists, of course, have long since discovered the delights of this unadulterated environment. But whilst most of them lounge on their hotel beaches, we are off at the weekend with Dr. Balasuraya, 
and his family for a picnic at his favourite riverside spot. Whilst the family enjoy their picnic, it's washing day for some. Here's proof of how clean the water is and how unspoilt the countryside. On Monday, it's back to work. By the way, the pluckers are not carrying spears. They use the long rods to mark their plucking area so that the tea bushes are plucked uniformly all over, ensuring an even flush of new shoots. Two leaves and a bud, two leaves and a bud, but not all the shoots. The leaves that are plucked should all be approximately the same size. In Sri Lanka, plucking goes on all the year round. The climatic conditions in the main tea growing areas located in the east and in the west are permanently at odds, so that at any given time there is always top quality tea being harvested somewhere. Connoisseurs of Ceylon tea are particularly fond of its fresh tangy flavour. The best salons are the high growns, growing at elevations between 1,500 and 2,000 meters, and generally coming from the districts of Uva and Dimbula. A plucker can harvest up to 25 kilograms of green leaf a day. That boils down to a mere six kilograms of made tea. <laughs> In Sri Lanka, tea is produced mainly by the traditional orthodox method, although there is some CTC production. The story continues in Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka. Colombo is the auction center where the major tea trading companies are based, and of course, the main port of trade. Vast amounts of tea are shipped from the busy port of Colombo. Sri Lanka is the third largest producer of tea, next to India and China, supplying about one-tenth of the world production. Produce of Sri Lanka, it says in bold lettering on the crates. But the tea is still labelled Ceylon on the packages we buy in Europe. Here in Colombo, and in other major ports all over the world, in India and Kenya, in China, Indonesia, and in Bangladesh, the tea chests are heaved aboard by crane. Very often nowadays, tea is containerized for shipment. Although there are no statistics to show just how many people all over the world are dependent on tea for a living, certainly for the Asian countries, tea is a vital economic factor and provides jobs for millions of people, whether pluckers, truckers, factory workers, or dockside laborers. From those who provide to those who enjoy it, Tea is the most widely consumed beverage in the world, second only to plain water. Hong Kong Express Nordic Radio.
Ja, schönen guten Tag, Hong Kong Express. Wie ist denn Ihr Rufzeichen? The Hong Kong Express left the port of Colombo 10 days ago. The operator from the Radio Nordic Telegraphic Service on the North German coast has just got through to Hamburg. Ein Gespräch nach Hamburg. Okay, welche Nummer? 3, 9, The Hong Kong Express has a cargo of tea on board. Ship's officer Fröhlich is making a call to his family. Ja, zwei Mann sind uns hier ernsthaft krank geworden. Ich bin okay. Und die Fahrt ist auch ziemlich ruhig. Wie geht's dir? Ich freue mich schon. Dienstag werden wir wohl da sein und dann habe ich ein paar Tage Zeit. Wie ist es denn bei euch? Kalt? Überleg doch schon mal, was wir machen wollen. Tschüss und Grüße alle. A container ship like the Hong Kong takes 25 days from Colombo to Hamburg. The sailing ships of former times, tea clippers as they were called, needed nearly four months to cover the same distance. At last, the final destination, the container terminal in Hamburg docks. Ship's officer Frohlich is off home and the containers with their chests of tea heaved from board. Carefully maneuvered with great precision by automatic hoisting bridges. Here comes our precious cargo, safely containerized on the last lap of its long voyage across the oceans. And by some system which is beyond our comprehension, Each of these massive steel containers is assigned to its rightful place. Freed at last, hundreds of chests of tea from tea-producing countries across the world are neatly stacked in mountainous blocks here in one of the huge warehouses in the Hamburg dock area. Nowadays, tea is as well packed in sacks due to the growing consumer's environmental consciousness. Hein speeds along the gangways on his forklift truck at a dizzy pace. There's enough tea here for innumerable Mad Hatter's tea parties. 90% of all Germany's tea imports pass through the Hamburg warehouses. From this point, the tea is delivered to the tea trading companies. Here, for instance, in Hamburg's picturesque old warehouse area, with its sleek waterways and its typical red brick facades and turrets. A fine example of the architectural style favored by Hamburg merchants in the last century. Inside these historic buildings, experts are at work, blending tea later to become some of the well-known blends. But first, let us watch a tea tasting session. Wir bereiten jetzt einen Aufguss vor. Mit der Handwaage werden 2,8. Using a pair of manual scales, we take exactly 2.8 grams of tea per cup. This weight is the equivalent of an old English sixpenny bit, the internationally prescribed amount for tea tasting, and ensures that tea tasters all over the world work under equal conditions. Herr Helmich has 20 years experience as a tea taster in the city of Bremen, the second most important tea center in Germany. What he is demonstrating here is done in an identical manner by Mr. Sen in Calcutta. Today, we are going to sample a variety of teas from one particular province. We have already subjected the dry leaf to a sensory test. Now we shall examine the liquor. By sense of smell, the tea taster can recognize and appraise a number of characteristics. His sense of taste then serves to confirm what his nose has already told him. And then Herr Helmich 
relishes the tea, for all the world as if he were sampling an exquisite wine. If the tea taster is satisfied, the tea can be blended. The object of blending is to ensure that a certain brand of tea will always taste the same, regardless of how the crop may have turned out or seasonal influences. These are the roundabouts, as they are sometimes called. Machines which fill and seal the packets automatically, under hygienic conditions, sealing in all the flavour and protecting the tea from moisture. We are almost at the end of the journey. The green gold is packed and labelled. Ready for the supermarket shelves. It is purely a matter of taste which type of teapot is used. The British influence behind these unique pots is unmistakable. to imagine the world today without tea. More than three and a half billion people on our planet are united through their preference for this pure, natural product. The elixir of life, cup by cup.